So the site of Magic Mountain, for those of you unfamiliar, and I don't really expect a lot of people to be familiar with this site, it is located in Golden, Colorado. It is right at the trailhead to the Apex Trail, which uh, m many of you have probably heard of before. It is right off of the parking lot there where they have brand new bathrooms, right by Heritage Square, it, right on this Lena Gulch, about 20 minutes from the museum. Super easy to get to. Well, 25 if you drive like me. I'm a slow driver. <laughs> it is a gorgeous site. It is just nestled into this area where you feel like you're out in wilderness, even though you're right butted up against community and the parking lot is right there. Really quite gorgeous. You can see Denver here in the background. So this is looking east. Very easy to access. Like I said, it's right, it, right off the parking lot. This um, Kinney Trail Run, which goes into the communities up here, is right by the site. The, this is the site here and it goes onto the other side of this hog back here. So it's all around this area. People, anybody can get to this site. It's really fantastic to have such a great, amazing resource in our backyards, literally. And there's even picnic tables on the site, unfortunately, but <laughs> they are there. So there's just a lot of opportunities to enjoy this beautiful landscape. Now, this site has been excavated twice in the past, and there's been numerous people who have walked by and picked up materials over many, many years with this being in such a prominent location. But the first ex excavations occurred in the 1950s by Harvard University and specifically by um, Cynthia Irwin Williams, who had ties to this muse museum. And um, though all of those materials are still at Harvard. In the 1990s, Centennial Archaeology, which is a cultural resource management firm in, in this area, they're in Fort Collins, they did some more research on the site. They put in this um, eight by eight meter unit. This is a bird's eye view. Like I said, you can see the parking lot, the new bathrooms. Um, and all of the materials from Centennial excavations, they came to our museum here. I have a cart of them here, so I will bring that outside and I can show them to some, some of the materials to you. And I'm going to show you some pictures of what these look like as well. We are currently processing these data, um, all of these materials. They're in our collection, but we had a class at the, with the University of Colorado Denver over the last semester where we took pictures of everything, scanned all the site forms, and this is going to be one of our first collections that goes online. And there's still a lot of work to do, but we're really excited about it. So from this research that has happened over the last decade or, or the last few decades, we know quite a bit about this site and how important it is in Colorado prehistory. We know that it was occupied first, well, the first evidence that we have was from 5500 BC. There's probably even earlier stuff at the site that hasn't been excavated, but it, it's hypothesized that there's Paleo-Indian remains there going back to Clovis period that hopefully we can find in these new excavations. But we have evidence going all the way of people living there all the way up until a thousand years ago or so. So over 6,500 years of people living in this one location. It's right on this creek. I mean, this is a seasonal creek, but there's also a, a natural spring right there. So people could have lived there year round. And we know that starting out in the early archaic period, this was a seasonal campground. People would come, they would do their hunting, they're gathering, they would stay there for a certain amounts of time, and then maybe they would move on to a bunch of other sites up and down the Front Range, which I'll show you in a second. By the, the early ceramic period, by a thousand years ago, we have evidence of houses. Some of the only houses that have ever been found from this period are at this site, and I'm going to show you pictures of these. This is such an incredible resource that we just don't know about, and I really want to make this a part of our local lore. This site is right down the street from Dinosaur Ridge. People should know about this just like they know about Dinosaur Ridge. This is hugely important. It's such a beautiful place. We all love it for just as the same reasons. We all love the nature of this place for the same reasons the people who lived there loved it. So the site of Magic Mountain, this is Jefferson County, um, just for reference, the, the dotted lines are the, the hogbacks. And so the site of Magic Mountain is located right at the yellow dot. And this is the early archaic period, and this is the early ceramic period. So this is covering that 6,500 years. And you can see there's all these other dots and numbers. These are other sites. So Magic Mountain was one of a huge network of interaction that was happening 
throughout time. It was changing and shifting. And we find materials that are from distances really far away, obsidian tools that are not from this particular area, and different stones. And so we can start to understand how people moved around the landscape and interacted in this part, in this part of the world that we call home. This is a picture from the excavations from the 1990s. And you can see this hole is very small. It's an eight meter by eight meter hole. And we know that there's a lot more out there. There's been some core testing going, so where they went around and took some cores. And there's just remains that are pro uh, probably all up and down this creek that have yet to be uncovered. But this is the, the excavation I'm gonna mostly be talking about because this is what we have the most evidence for. I should say, they wrote, the Centennial Archaeology wrote an incredible tome on their excavations, but it is gray literature. I had to go to the PI from the 1990s, borrow it, and photocopy it, because it doesn't exist in our public, in the public world. So we really have, a, we have a lot to do to make this such a much more accessible site. These are some of the artifacts that are coming out of the site. Gorgeous, gorgeous projectile points with materials from up and down the front range. And I have some of these here that I'm happy to show you and talk about. These are um, perforators that would have been used to punch holes into leather for making clothing and for making, um, for making housing you know, for the hides that would have gone over the structures. This is a scraper on the end here that would have been used for scraping hides. We find all kinds of bone tools really neat bone tools at the site that would have been used for all different purposes, sewing, um, shaft straighteners, and manos and matates for grinding the different vegetal remains and um, other foodstuffs. So hunting gathering site that was happening here, you see all kinds of animals were hunted, stuff that doesn't even exist in this part of Colorado anymore. So this is a great opportunity to look at the past um, floral and fauna of this region and really dive into how things have changed and what was the impetus behind those changes, people, climate, other variations. So we've really got some fun things with the zoology that we can do in the, um, in the paleobotany. And so you'll see that pronghorn, for example, and gray wolf were found at this site, which you probably would not find in the area today. And then the plant stuff. And it's important to note that we, never, we didn't find any corn or domesticated plants. So this was truly a gathering location. People were not growing crops while living here. One of the things I was super excited about was ceramics. Ceramics in this part of the world are very rare. And so these are from the later part, you know, the early ceramic period from um, after 200 AD. But these are really neat. They have um, cord marking on them. And they're very similar to ceramics that are found in um, the east, so towards Mississippi and the, what's called the woodland cultures in the woodland period. And they're not similar to the stuff you find in the Southwest. So thinking about spheres of interaction and who these people were, were associated with is really, really interesting. This is what those ceramics look like as full vessels. And then, like I said, these, this house structure, this is incredible. So this is that eight by eight meter unit that you're looking in and this foundation which is a semicircle is only, you can only see it in part of the unit. There was so much more to the structure that's still there that has not been excavated. And what the excavators believe though, it is a foundation for a house that would have looked a lot like this here. This is an artistic reconstruction done by um, an artist who worked very closely with the archeologists who excavated this site in the San Luis Valley so that it's completely accurate and um, you can see the, the types of activities that would have been performed here. And um, this structure, this house structure here, is probably quite similar to the structures that we see at Magic Mountain, but we, we have to go and find out. So the field trip, what are we gonna be doing? That's the context and the background of the site. But the field trip is an opportunity to get out there and do some of this preliminary research to figure out where we're gonna dig in the future. And we're gonna do this by using geophysical instruments, both magnetometry and ground penetrating radar, which I will explain much more in depth later. But these are um, two, well, these are two very useful compatible techniques. And like I said, we're gonna be working with the top experts in the world on these techniques who are coming here for this project. Really incredible opportunity. It will be two days in August and um, the specialists are coming on the first, and so they'll be working on the first and the second. 
So we'll already have data that we can show how it was processed and we can use that to go on and to build off of it. So you'll get to see the whole process of how, what data looks like after it's been, um, been processed and how you develop more data. These are half day field trips. You are welcome to stay if you are so excited about geophysics and help out for the rest of the day. I just wanted to put that out there. So again, this is our bird's eye view of the site where the excavations were. These are where I'm proposing to do some of the geophysical work. The, uh, it's a TGBD. We, you can cover a lot of ground in a little time doing geophysics and really start to understand the landscape. So magnetometry is a technique that measures the different magnetic field properties of the, of the soil. And so anytime you dig a ditch and that ditch then fills back in with different soil, the, the properties are different between the original stuff and then the new stuff that filled it in. And these show up as anomalies in the magnet, magnetic data. Things that show up really great are when soil's been burnt. So like hearths show up really, really, really well. But we can potentially find where there's been excavation in the past and where it's been filled in, and if this relates to any prehistoric patterns. You can see here, this is a picture from Ohio where you can barely see on the surface at all these <laughs> incredible stru circular structures, and um, but with doing magnetometry, they just pop out. And some of you may have heard recently, there a few years back, there was a survey of Stonehenge landscape where they found hundreds and hundreds of features using magnetometry to just complicate the Neolithic world. It looks, it's pretty incredible what they've been finding. So you, we're gonna be using this technique. Dr. Ken Kavami is coming here. He's from the University of Arkansas and is one of the top experts in this. So we really, I'm really excited to, to um, talk with him and interact with him at, at Magic Mountain. We're also gonna be doing ground penetrating radar, which is a slightly different technique and complementary. It definitely resolves different things. I'm gonna explain how it works a little bit more in a second. Uh, Dr. Larry Conyers at the University of Denver is going to come over and help us with this. He is also one of the top experts in the world. I did my master's thesis with Larry, so I've done quite a bit of ground penetrating radar. This is me in Bolivia in 2005. <laughs> Pay no attention to my Snoopy t-shirt. <laughs> it was really the height of fashion at the time. But you can also see how the, the machine has developed over the years. This is us using a wheelbarrow in like Altiplano, Bolivia, and then this newfangled, uh, we call it the baby carriage. <laughs> it's much easier to use. But take note of this um, orange box here. So both ground penetrating radar and magnetometry are collected in rectilinear grids. And this is important because I'm gonna talk a bit about processing the data. And so it's important to know how it's collected. You start in an arbitrary Southwest corner, doesn't really matter where it is. And you do a transect, turn around, do a transect back until you've completed your rectangle or rectangle-ish shaped um, feature that you're doing. You can extend it and top if you wanna make it longer. So this is how the data are collected. Now, rad ground penetrating radar, GPR, is more, a little more complex than uh, magnetometry. It can see things in three dimensions, so we can get the depth of, fe of features below the surface. And bear with me, <laughs> what happens is you take your orange box that you saw and you pull it across the ground surface and it shoots electromagnetic energy into the ground and also receives electromagnetic energy back into this antenna, or there's two antennae in this box. And so the energy is traveling through the ground and when it sees uh, so an object that's of a different, kind of think of it as like a density, but it's of a different substance. We call it in physics terms, a relative, has a different relative dielectric permittivity. Um, that will reflect back to the, to the antenna. And so what you get are these series of reflections in a profile. So this is that profile if you're just walking along the ground. And the a point reflection, or so if you're going perpendicular over a wall, it will create what is called, what we call hyperbolic reflection, even though I know it's technically a, hyper, a, a parabola, but <laughs> we won't get all fussy on our geometry. And so you have this hyperbolic reflection. So these are point sources. There's one particular point underground that the radar, that the, mach the machine went over. 
When you go over a surface that's like a floor, a flat floor that's different from the surrounding matrix underground, you get a flat planar reflection, something like this. And so what you can do is these, these um, profiles are collected in time. You can later convert them to depth. And um, you could stack them all together, push them all together, and then line them up, and then you slice them going down to create different slices of the subsurface at different depths below the surface. So what this looks like is this is a GPR survey I did in New Mexico last year where we were looking for a potential pit house village, and we found this pit house that's about 105 centimeters below the surface. And you can see in this reflection here, the nice flat surface of the pit house and the walls on either side. Yeah, sorry if you didn't get it. This is beautiful, by the way. <laughs> this is textbook. <laughs> I was very excited about it. So what you can do then, and this is exactly what we're going to do at Magic Mountain, is use this information to excavate. And so this is from my master's thesis, and it's very <laughs> complicated data. But you see there's a, a reflection down here which um, I determined to be this pavement surface from excavating. And this is the line, this is the profile. This is the profile that's produced. And then there's a higher reflection up here, which ended up being the top of a conduit. So by looking at this and really starting to pull it apart, you can really find out a lot about what's going on below the ground without ever putting the shovel in the ground. So again, these are some of the areas we'd like to investigate. Um, but since the 1990s, the city of Golden, who owns this land, um, acquired this whole other parcel of land. And so we're going to be able to possibly put some grids over there and just do some work in this, in this new part of the site. So, that, so the KT Challenge would support this research, the geophysical research, but I also just wanted to show, share with you briefly the other research that this will support after the geophysical work is completed. We're going to do drone mapping, so using uh, photogrammetry to create three-dimensional images from the two-dimensional photos to do accurate topographic maps. This combined with the geophysics, we're going to have such a good understanding of what's happening below our feet. It'll be really, really cool. That new area, we'll be able to do pedestrian survey, so we can walk across the, the walk in that area and see what we find. This is very common in archaeology. People may have picked stuff up over the years, but we might get lucky and find some stuff. And then finally, the excavations, which based on this new research, we'll be able to decide where to go. And this will be a community effort where we can get anybody involved who wants to come out and learn about how incredible this site is right in our backyard. And then finally, there's lots of lab work that goes along with it. There'll be lots of opportunities to participate in that lab work here at the museum and to help really make sense of all the new findings. So come play. It's going to be a really, really fun time. And we're going to learn a lot about this incredibly important site that we really need to put on the map of Colorado prehistory. So thanks.